With a very slight delay, hello and welcome to SPOW 25 and the Meet the Editors of the Journal of European Landscape um, session this afternoon. Um, my name is Irene van Rossum. I'm commissioning editor at um, Amsterdam University Press, where I'm uh, managing the journal's portfolio. I'm uh, joined here by Linda Egberts and Hans Rennes, both of the University in Amsterdam. Um, to start, we made this session coincide with the uh, virtual online meeting of the association meeting of critical heritage studies, um, which of course is not in London today, um, due for uh, the obvious reasons, but uh, there's no conference without a book fair and uh, AUP is happy to announced that we have a virtual exhibit um, where we offer a 40% discount on relevant titles on heritage and memory studies. Um, uh, we are very grateful for people to have given us questions for the meeting in advance. Um, if there are further questions to be asked, there's a hashtag. Um, it's not on the screen right now, but it's a hashtag um, AUPGEL and on Twitter, and we will be keeping an eye on um, questions coming in. Um, we're very happy to have this uh, uh, session here. Um, I think that's what I'll have to say for me. Um, uh, Hans Gnes will start uh, introducing the journal and, um, and himself. <laughs> Thank you, Irene. Um, I'm Hans van Ness. I'm originally uh, educated as a historical geographer and worked on that for uh, quite a number of decades. And I'm also a member of some international organizations, board member even, on the history of landscape in relation to planning and also in relation to heritage. Uh, since um, 10 years, I also, also have a chair in heritage studies, mainly in relation to landscape at uh, the VU University in Amsterdam. Now, one of our present projects is this beautiful journal of European landscapes, and uh, I, will, I want to say a few things about why this journal. Uh, initially, uh, Amsterdam University Press asked me and a colleague, um, archaeologist, Professor, Professor Jan Kolen, who is not here today, to think about uh, a journal. And um, we have done some research and we thought that there are many journals on landscape, many on the theory of landscape and even more on local and regional landscapes. But what was missing is a really international journal. And one of the reasons to start such a journal is that there are uh, increasing numbers of European-wide projects in which landscapes are researched on an international, uh, in an international perspective. And many of this, these data are, as we call it, grey. They disappear in the course of time and after a few years the website of the project is lost and no one knows anymore that it's happening. And there's such an, an amount of useful information. And because of this perspective of much information being lost in the course of time, we thought it was a good idea to document these international projects. And that's why we started the journal with the, the following types of publications. The first is articles, scientific papers, which will be and are peer-reviewed, and which will have to which need to have an international perspective. So no local, regional, national case studies, but really comparative studies that uh, have an, a transnational perspective. Uh, the same is true for the other types of, pro of, of publications. One is uh, projects, which will be documentation of the, the project I just mentioned. And that means that uh, we plan to publish, and we already published a number of them, uh, short articles on projects, those who inf are involved, and especially also the places where the data can be found and the main results. And then the third 
type of publications is, of course, I would say, um, book reviews. So that's what we started with. And um, in fact, the first publications have only been put online a few months ago. So this is really the first big presentation of this journal. And we are glad you're all here. And we are very interested in hearing your remarks and your questions. We, will offer, we can offer you possibilities to publish. And of course, we also need reviewers, reviewers for books, but also reviewers for articles. So that's, um, that's for the first information. Give the chair to my colleague, Linda. Good afternoon, or at least afternoon here in Amsterdam. Uh, my name is Linda Egbert. I am an um, uh, assistant professor in heritage studies at Vrije Universiteit, and I'm a colleague of Hans Rennes. Um, I joined the team of the um, uh, Journal of European Landscapes as a chief editor, um, well, almost two years ago, um, based on my, actually on my frustrations in my own research as an international uh, as, a, as a, an international scholar or a scholar with international research interests, uh, geographic comparisons between heritage practices in various areas and various landscapes across Europe, and not being able to find a proper platform to share my ideas and to share this sort of international comparative or contextualizing endeavor um, with, with scholars who had the same interest. So, uh, coming across the initiative of Hans Rennes and several of our colleagues uh, uh, really struck me as something that, that, could, uh, that could help me overcome this frustration of not being able to find the platform that I wanted to publish on. As a chief editor, I will not be publishing that much myself, but I will, I'm very happy that I'm able to offer other scholars the opportunity to actually have that platform. And not only established scholars, but particularly I noticed that young scholars in the heritage and landscape studies fields are especially interested in diving into international and contextualizing studies more maybe than the established generations. Um, and it's all still explorative and looking for, for ways to make this useful and meaningful to look at or trying to understand localities and characteristics of landscapes in one particular place by comparing them or seeing them in the light of what happens in other places in Europe or outside Europe. Um, it really could help us understand better what is unique about places and how do they transform in their own way and also how are they connected to more global processes of change uh, that, that influence every landscape in the world, not the least by climate change, for example. So my fascination in my own research um, on um, cultural heritage practices in, in landscape transformations really connects very closely to my desire to, to create a platform for this kind of international research. Um, so that's the reason why I am making time to do this and, and trying to put my energy into to getting this journal uh, running and, uh, and making it sustainable for the future. Um, Hans already said a lot about what the, the journal as a platform could offer in terms of uh, what sort of contributions it welcomes. And <clears throat> I can maybe not repeat it enough, but having a sort of a contextualizing interest in one locality, trying to understand that in a broader in international or transnational context is really key to, to the, the criteria of, of what sort of publications would be uh, feasible for um, for uh, being part of the journal, being placed in the journal. This counts for research articles, this counts for uh, documentation of international projects. It counts also for book reviews. If you want to review a book or have your own book reviewed, there, there must be some sort of um, international contextualizing aspect to that, that book. Um, and it also counts for, for interviews, and it's a category that Hans did not mention yet, but we actually started our journal with, with one of the first articles, uh, it, which, is a, uh, it, which is an interview with Kenneth Olwig. Um, so we would also, we're also interested in, in, in reflecting on this, this international comparative perspective on landscapes and heritage practices with 
people in the field, um, author authorities maybe later in their career, but also younger ones. So if you have good ideas about interviewing exciting new pers uh, people with new perspectives on this topic, then contact us and see if we can, uh, we can uh, highlight this perspective by um, making an interview together with this specific person. Um, I think that's more than enough about me, uh, but, but maybe we can um, move on to, to answering some of the questions. I think why a Journal of European Landscapes has been answered pretty, pretty extensively by, by Hans already. Uh, the contributions I've mentioned, um, uh, will, will, another question would be, will, my, will the journal be willing to place a re review of my book? Well, maybe, if there is this international comparative contextualizing component, transnational component to it, and a landscape or heritage component, spatial component, it might be possible that we would like to place a review, but please get in contact with us through our email address and we will get back to you very quickly and, and saying if we are interested and maybe also have some suggestions for reviewers who could be able to take that on. Um, and then the last question that is on, on my list that we've sort of pre-designed for this Q&A is, is the, is the journal open for proposals for special issues? And I would say yes, very much so. It would be very interesting to have a, a set of articles on a specific topic within the European landscape topic that we, that we sort of want to address or related to uh, societal urgencies that are, that are ongoing or to specific uh, subfields within this broader um, field of research. Um, and maybe it's good to also stress that this journal will not have a, a printed version. It will not have a, a, a special issue, literal issue, as in a printed thing with five articles on, this, on a similar topic, um, but it will be a cluster of articles that are published in a, in, in a certain, in, in a few months' time, let's say, um, online. It's, it will be an online journal, open access at least for the first few years, um, which means that uh, you will not have a printed issue as such, but we will have a, several, a set of articles that will be visible as a cluster of topics on the website of, of the journal. Uh, for, for a longer period of time. Um, I will give the word back to, to Hans Renes to answer some other questions that have come in. Yes, and one of the questions was, what does the journal offer for, to authors? Well, what we do offer is a publication possibility. And even when you take into account that uh, we didn't have a lot of publicity because of these difficult corona times, uh, I was surprised by the number of hits and downloads the journal has, uh, has attracted already. So we can offer authors a publication possibility and at the moment it, we have money for a, one or two years to offer golden open access. So there are no costs involved. Although we would like to have some extra money when projects lead to uh, to special issues, for example, but we talk about that later. And then, would the journal be willing to publish a discussion of my project? Well, when the project fits into our scope, the answer is definitely yes. Um, I did say a lot already about the, the scope and the aims of the journal, but um, it's also written down in the editorial, and you can, um, you can find that on the website of the journal, which is Journal of European Landscapes, written as one word, .eu. There you find all the um, publications, uh, including the project description that was published this week, uh, all together, and you can have an overview, and you can also uh, push a button so you will be informed about uh, future publications. So the answer is yes. Now, we imagine that future authors might be curious to know what they can expect from the uh, submission, peer review, and editorial process uh, when writing for the journal. 
And I think it's important to make a distinction between the different kinds of uh, articles that we would publish. So for research papers, we have a peer review process in place in which uh, after submission of an article, um, the, the article is first assessed by the editors to see if it fits the scope of the, the, the journal and if it's interesting to send it off to the peer reviewers. And then we will select two peer reviewers from our international network to, uh, to have a look at, um, at the, the paper and to provide feedback and to also decide whether it's acceptable, whether it needs major or minor revisions or whether it can be published as it is. And then after that, we will go into the process of, um, uh, of proofreading and, uh, and copy editing, etc. For the other, for all the, the, the papers uh, and other contributions, um, uh, there is most often contact between the editorial board and authors. That also counts for interviews, it counts for book reviews, and uh, it counts for, for project descriptions. Um, the other three categories of, of publications will not go through pre peer review, but will be reviewed by the editors only. Um, so you, if you contact us directly on our email address, um, we, we can easily communicate uh, about what the next steps, steps would be. And then after our initial contact, um, it is possible to use the submission system that we have in place for submitting uh, your contribution to the journal and then it will go into the official reviewing process. I think there are a few questions for Irene as well. Yes, are there any other questions where they have come in or not? So Irene will, will answer a few questions more about the, uh, about the ways to publish and then we'll come back to some more questions from the floor. The floor. Okay, so one of the questions I think that I was asked to answer has already been asked, answered. It's say, can I publish in open access? Um, yes. And we're very, as Hans said, we're very fortunate to have funding for the journal. So authors are not required to find their own um, uh, article processing charges, at least for the f first few years. Um, maybe I should s mention who the sponsors are. It'd be nice. The, the journal is currently sponsored by uh, the FUPLUS, which is a interfaculty. Let me get this right. Interfaculty Research Institute for Culture, Cognition, History, and Heritage at VU University in Amsterdam, as well as the Center for Global Heritage and Development a collaboration of Leiden University, Delft University of Technology, and Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Um, so that's the good news. Um, another question is, what services and added value does the publisher, AUP, offer? Um, good question. Um, I would like to say, as a publishing partner to a journal, um, the publisher does everything that the editor should not be doing. Editors should be focusing on selecting and, and reviewing quality articles for the journal, and, and that's their main focus. Um, the publisher should do basically everything else. I always see ourselves as a, the spider in the web connecting the dots between readers, authors, editors, um, libraries. Um, so we do marketing, we make sure that the metadata is, is uh, in order, we, we supply the platform. Um, make sure that the typesetting is, is done, uh, DOIs are registered, and of, that the articles are discoverable online, which is very important with, um, with open access uh, articles, of course. Um, I think that covers mostly what the publishers do. Um, if there's any other questions, then again, the hashtag is um, J-E-L-A-U-P. Uh, sorry, A U P dot J E E A U P J E L. One of the things I might have forgotten to mention, and maybe I hope that Irene would cover, is is whether the journal could offer any services in correcting 
English if you're not a native writer or a native speaker? And the answer is yes. Um, but to, addition, to small additional charges, we have professional language correctors available who could assist you in upgrading your language in such a way that it is up to par with academic standards of writing in English. Um, then uh, other questions that have come, come in. Um, the first one I would like to mention is by, by Toen van den Doel, who actually provided two questions, but I, I will summarize them as one. Um, he addresses the, uh, that the internet is virtual and it's becoming bigger and bigger, um, but the digital domain also inhibits landscapes and shapes landscapes, especially in the early years um, of the development. But later on, it might be expected that the spatial need for internet facilities uh, will decrease um, and what will, happen to the, what will happen to the physical manifestations of the digital. So he suggests that maybe Bernd and Hilla Becher, two German um, photographers uh, and fanatics about industrial uh, remnants, uh, take on the post-industrial era. And I suppose what, what, he, what he's trying to ask with this question is, is this kind of topic of interest for the journal, would the journal be willing to publish a paper on this topic? And you have heard us say quite a, quite a bit on this already, and I think th the easy answer is yes, of course, if it has an international contextualizing and spatial component. Now, the, the spatial is covered in the, the, in the landscapes of the digital, um, and the internet is, is in essence a very international thing, but also if, if the paper would somehow address the international connections and the international uh, context of, of how uh, the digital manifests itself in landscapes, then absolutely yes. It's also about spatial inequalities, maybe. Some, some places might be much more uh, shaped by the digital than others. Could be very interesting to look at, at those too. Um, if, if you are interested in publishing with us, then, then give us a shout out through uh, our email address and we'll get back to you if you have a, a, an abstract or a proposal uh, ready for us. Um, and then there is a question uh, for Hans, I think. Okay. Here's an, a question. I will soon write a review about hobby associations and their role in animal welfare advancements in the pet sector. In this article, I will discuss the role of European policy and the effect of stakeholder interactions discourse on marginalization in the policy domain. domain, domain. Would this topic be fit for publication in, our, in your journal? Um, well, the focus of the journal is landscape and animal welfare without um, connection to landscape issues would be uh, a bit too far from our main uh, focus, I would say. So, but when you have uh, comparable themes with a clear connection to landscape, and there, there are connections between landscape and animal welfare, for example, in intensive animal husbandry, mm -hmm. then we, uh, we will look at it very, uh, with a very positive eye. Those are the questions we have received beforehand. Are there any more? Yes. Um, so, Linda, you spoke um, about global processes of change and how that can be of interest to the journal. Um, I hate to use the C word, but how do you predict? Can you offer any predictions about what the coronavirus pandemic um, might do to the field of landscape and heritage studies, if it will do anything, if it will have an effect. Um, well, obviously it will have an effect because <laughs> it's having an effect on everything. But specifically within your field, can you see anything that might come up? Well, there's a lot coming up, but I think the, the answer to the question is twofold. There's on the one hand, the this, this studies as a, as a field of research, as a community of researchers, and there is uh, the thing of the ways in which corona, the behaviors related to con corona restrictions and fear and um, uh, uh, all the logistics that come with, with, with tackling such a, a crisis 
uh, have on, on, on the physical landscapes and on the, the culture, the way that we experience landscape. So there's, there's two, there's, on a, there's a community research content, there's a, there's a research community answer and there is a content answer. When it comes to the research community, we already experience the effects. Uh, if not for Corona, we would have been in London at the moment and we would have been in, in a minute having dinner with our critical heritage studies colleagues discussing European landscapes at the table rather than being here in Amsterdam looking into an almost empty room. Um, so, so that means that uh, interaction and debate about uh, landscapes uh, have, have, have received quite a bit of a, a a punch in a negative way um, and, and maybe there with offering a platform and offering an interactive platform to researchers to keep on discussing their, um, th their work uh, outside their own small community within their university, their daily colleagues or their students might, might be even more important than, than before. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's less self-evident that we meet each other uh, physically in, uh, within the community. Um, and the other question is, will corona affect, uh, affect cultural landscapes? Uh, yes, of course, it already does in many ways. Um, just to give you a small example, um, I've, I've been following uh, j jokes and comments on Twitter about, uh, about how people deal with lockdown. And it seems that we, now that we have restrictions on international travel, people start looking at their own living environments on a very different scale of, 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 a, of a radius than before. Uh, homes get redesigned, gardens get completely turned over, people start vegetable gardens where they have never had uh, experience in landscaping or gardening before. Uh, they start exploring the hiking trails around their, own, the, around their own houses much more intensively than they used to do because they were able to fly to Thailand for, for vacation. So the appreciation and the knowledge of and the experience of landscapes have, have become in a sense maybe more localized in a physical way. But of course we've also collectively explored internet and started using uh, inter internet connections much more for communication. So on the one hand, there is more, more sort of globalization through these increased Zoom and other meeting connections. And on the other hand, there's also a, a different exploration of, of our own living environments on a different radius for now during lockdown. And, and we'll see how that, will, how that will change in the future. But it's interesting to to reflect on those, and that could actually lead into a very interesting international comparative article on the ways in which people use their local environments during lockdown. That's perhaps one nice example to, uh, to mention that uh, some articles in 2001 on the, um, the effects of the foot and mouth disease on English uplands. And, it would be, in fact, very interesting to look uh, what the remaining effects are 20 years after. But the, there are effects, and perhaps that article I just mentioned was written too fast. Uh, you need some time for um, reflection. But it, it is an interesting and international theme. Okay. And I suppose it will have a big impact on tourism as well, which would that be a theme that you say ties into, ties into the journal as well? Yes. Yeah. Um, we have another question, and it's a bit, bit different. Um, so a, lo a lot of artists and filmmakers and fiction writers or literary writers, um, I would say, are currently working also in the field, field of landscape studies. If you go into the Ateneum Bookhandel across the road, you'll find a huge table full of um, psychogeography, um, all of those, those kind of explorations of the urban and also the um, rural environment. Um, in terms of the journal, um, and you, you mentioned interviews, would the journal be willing to interview um, people outside of academia um, if, you know, if, if the subject was right, because I know that there are a lot of writers who maybe pursue an academic um, framework but might not be an academic employed at a university. If, if that came up, would that be something that you would, would welcome? 
I would personally welcome that very much. Uh, we haven't really discussed that, but we have in the, um, in the editorial um, some remarks on the idea and the, the history of the idea of landscape, and then you come immediately to uh, painters, to poets. So these, these sources are very important idea indeed in the, the existing and the, the developing of the whole idea of landscape. So, yes? Another part of an answer to that question, Lucia, could also be an interview could be an interesting form for some, uh, but there might also be people maybe a little bit outside of academia who have an uh, uh, interesting research topic at hand, who have less experience in publishing academically, but have a very interesting story to tell with, with relevant sources, etc. cetera. Um, and, and actually, I, I think we, we, we are not too exclusive about who can be writers of peer-reviewed articles. If, if there are people with an, with an interesting, relevant topic and a good set of ideas, then we are very willing to help them shape their article in such a way that it would be fit for peer review in to up to academic standards. So there is always, it depends really on the material, it depends on the person, it depends on the, on the, the sort of cooperation possible, but the, edit, the editors have years of experience in helping people from right outside academia or a bit, bit further away or young, uh, young publishers without much academic experience to get on that stage and really engage in that platform. So, so um, if that will be something that, that someone is interested in, then, then contact us with your idea and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, and I suppose a follow-up follow -up question to, uh, to the previous one is, um, actually everybody on the stage, including Elena, um, do you have any particular favorite cultural films or music or arts that ties in with your passions about landscape and heritage studies? <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> I thought since this was such a carefully curated q and I'd just throw in a wild card. <laughs> <laughs> that took me by surprise. Um, there are certainly... I, I am, in fact, collecting material myself on uh, nationalist music from the 19th century, which uh, might, might be something for the future to publish. But um, I, I, I remember some very beautiful uh, movies that uh, focus on landscape and that really opened my eyes for very different aspects of landscape. Uh, I remember in my studies one Italian movie which was called The Clump Tree. It's a beautiful movie about uh, someone who stole wood from the landlord to make a cloggies for his son. And, they were ev evicted from the landscape, and that was one. Of, was during my studies. Was one of the first moments that I realized that landscape had to do with class and with power relations. So, yes, that, that's uh, that's an extremely interesting field. I hope that's an answer to you. Yeah. I think for me, it's about food. Um, be, being a, being a, a scholar in European uh, research projects, I, I had the luck to be able to travel a lot and to share experiences with um, partners who would then invite you locally and would, would invite you into their eating culture. Uh, regional identities and landscapes are very much tied into culinary traditions um, and, and enjoying food from a locality together with the people who are sort of sharing their, their pride and their, and their um, hospitality brings up a lot of stories to the table about how these people connect to the landscape that they live in. So, so eating together with people from other areas is a fantastic way into, into discussing what is important to them in these landscapes and how does this change in the course of time. Irene doesn't want to answer your question. <laughs> 
then maybe you can throw in another one. Uh, a, a question. You may also answer the last question for yourself. Perhaps something is flat also. Sorry. Something is flat also. <laughs> no. um, so this is skipping back a few questions or on the topic before. Um, we were talking a little bit about tourism and how that might be um, affected by by the coronavirus. Um, personally, I'm quite interested in the idea of landscaping and as a practice and how historically it came to be, especially in England and its um, class sort of symbols with the with the elite. Um, a lot of these a lot of these um, these estates now are sort of lacking in visitors. Lots of people not going to them. Uh, to visit, particularly in like the nor north and the Midlands in the UK, um, how? Yeah, my question is how. Um, firstly, how relevant do you think that these places are actually, and whether I think it maybe ties in a little bit with heri the heritage of statues and some of the statues that are being pulled down across the world. Um, a lot of these landscapes were funded um, by corrupt power means um how what, what's the relevance of these big landscaped estates and um would you yeah what's the relevance it's a big topping you're tipping into but um maybe let's start with an answer maybe maybe hans has a, has has more up his sleeve to to comp complement um but you're actually addressing several different things. First of all, the, the problem of these estates to attract enough visitors to upkeep their, uh, to, to, to provide for the maintenance of these places uh, that were formerly financed through big uh, class differences and, and, and exploitation of some people to the benefits of others. Um, uh, and the other question is, uh, how do you view these landscapes as contested landscapes, right? Can you only view them as as beautiful and and romantic and historical and valuable or do they also have a, a more con contested connotation i think yes but um and the uk is the particular area where there has actually been done some research on the contestedness of these landscapes but the problem in most cases particularly in well at least in the netherlands is that that this contestedness is not so visible in the landscapes per se the wealth was was most often generated somewhere else, maybe in colonies, where, where actually the exploitation took place and then it was spent and invested and demonstrated and, and you know, uh, celebrated in, in these places that you've just mentioned. So it is not always so easy to really put your finger on, well, this is actually what is bad about these places. It's a very general sense of unease that is growing, maybe. Um, and then, then a last question that you could put on top of that is, say, if there's not enough, if the visitor numbers are not great enough to upkeep all these places, and we should see them as contested landscapes, should we then not consider uh, a differentiation in heritage strategies? Should we maintain these places at all costs for society? Or should we actually be prepared to experiment with strategies of managed ruination or, uh, uh, or decay? Isn't there something to be found in uh, retreating uh, and not wanting to paint the windows every year? Uh, what, what, does happen, what happens to these, the stories of these places, to the physicalities of these places, to the relationship of current societies with these places if we actually dare to step back a little bit? And, and I think uh, Great Britain is very much onto heritage maintenance as are the Dutch, we, we are not very, very keen on, on letting things go and we are very, we are managers, right? Want you to upkeep everything. So actually experimenting with strategies of stepping back and seeing what happens then, leaving room for other, for other forms of life, for other interpretations, for, for change, um, might be actually a very daring but also very interesting thing to do. Uh, and in many ways, maybe also an unavoidable thing to do but let's let's see if we can make that meaningful let's 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 see if we can make it deliberate and, and critical uh, 
a few additions. One of the things is, of course, that we lost our innocence in uh, this whole research of landed estates. And, but still, when, when you go on an average guided tour in a landed estate, you hear a lot about the owners and very little about the way they, um, where their wealth came and about uh, the people they employed, including my family, mainly. Um, but there's something else I would like to say. We, have, we had a lot of discussions on the, the word European in a journal of European landscapes, and um, we didn't want to go to a journal of world landscapes. And one of the reasons is that Europe is quite uh, an overseeable, but also a very important um, level platform for landscape studies, particularly because of much ever more research in uh, rural landscapes and in planning is, is guided with from, from Europe, and very little on a world level still. But then, having said that, we, it was clear from the beginning that these European landscapes were not isolated. They, were, uh, they had connections with landscapes elsewhere. Um, because of, uh, well, slave trade is one thing, but also because of uh, other inputs, products, uh, in, um, uh, in gardens, um, the orange trees, etc. But also, uh, the idea of landscape is exported from Europe to other parts of the world, not just to uh, the Europeanized parts of the world, such as the United States or Australia, but also other parts of the world where colonials and others have uh, introduced European ideas of landscape. And even today, nowadays, on a world scale, because of the discussions on UNESCO World Heritage Landscape since 1992, there is an increasing worldwide uh, discussion on, uh, on landscapes in which uh, very much of the ideas are still coming from Europe, and it's uh, still a long way to go to come to a worldwide definition of, uh, of landscape and to include other types of landscape issues. So, yeah. Well, I guess there were no more questions. Um, I would like to say thank you very much to Hans and uh, Linda for explaining how the journal came about and what, it, uh, what the plans are for the future. I'd also like to thank the people here at SPY25 for helping us organize this session um, and um, for Lucia for organizing it from uh, Amsterdam University Press. Uh, the, I will repeat uh, the URL, it's journalofeuropeanlandscapes.eu, and I um, encourage you, all of you to, uh, to explore the website. Thank you very much.